Hello and welcome back to another live of Filipina American Creative. It is so nice to be back here on a Thursday afternoon. Hopefully your Memorial Day weekend was safe and happy and fun and all the good things. The unofficial start to summer is always a, a very interesting and good time, especially here in Arizona because we basically break 100 degrees and it just doesn't let up until probably about September or October. Anyways, it is so nice to be back here. Today, I decided that I wanted to dive deeper into the topic that I had started last week, which is President Manuel Quezon's open door policy. So this Philippine president felt it was so necessary to allow refugees from around the world to come to the Philippines at the beginning of the 20th century that he created eventually an official policy that set up a way for refugees from around the world to come to the Philippines. And this then led to a pretty incredible thing that happened throughout the 20th century is that there were multiple waves of refugees that ended up in the Philippines because of this open door policy that was started in the 30s. So I wanted to talk with you today about what happened exactly and what exactly that was, what that open door policy was. A little bit of a history lesson, if you will indulge me. And yeah, so let's just dive right into it. Last week, I talked about the play Mix Mix, which is about the adventures of a German Jewish boy who was fleeing Nazi persecution uh, in the late 1930s. And that story is based off of him and his family receiving visas from the Philippines. And that, again, was in, as a result of Ke President Quezon's open door policy. And the way that that started is that in the early 1930s, there was a lot of things happening around the world, not only in Europe, but also uh, just in China and all of these things. And so President Quezon was like, okay, look, the Philippines is going to be a place where people can go to find safety. And so in 1934, he told his people, we are going to let in thousands of refugees into our country and we are going to take care of them. I don't necessarily know if the Philippine people were completely kosher with that, especially at the time the Philippines was a commonwealth or part of the commonwealth of the United States. And so it wasn't just the Philippines that would have been involved in this. There also would have been a connection to the United States through the fact that the Philippines was a part of the commonwealth at that time. And so in 1937, President Quezon made it official with what was called Proclamation at Number 173. And that made it official for the Philippine government to create a system around being able to support and take care of refugees, including handing out thousands and thousands of visas to these refugees. The problem or the complicated situation around that is the fact that the Philippines was a part of the Commonwealth of the United States. And at the time, the United States did not want to participate in what was starting to become the Second World War. They saw it coming. They didn't want to be a part of it. They declared neutrality. And because the Philippines was connected to the U.S., if the Philippines was handing out visas to people that were being persecuted in Europe, it would look like the U.S. was taking a stance and a side. And so even though President Quezon wanted to have tens of thousands of visas handed out to European Jews, for example, uh, to come to the, to the Philippines, the U.S. government, it is said, hindered that by only allowing 1,000 visas to be given out to refugees per year over a 10-year span. Now, that 10-year span ended up becoming, ended up becoming, ended up getting cut short. <laughs> that 10-year span ended up getting cut short because the Japanese occupation started once World War II officially began. And so only a total of, at the time, a little over 1,200 European Jews who were refugees, came to the Philippines as opposed to the tens of thousands that President Quezon ended up wanting to have. So 
after that happened in 1937 and he created this proclamation in 1940, there was a, an official Philippine Immigration Act that was then put in place. And then we ended up in the Second World War and history ended up happening after that. What I want to say from the, this open door policy that happened is that as a result, there were nine waves of refugees that came to the Philippines throughout the 20th century and as recent as the year 2000. It's really remarkable that this many waves of refugees came to the Philippines, that the Philippines set up a program and a way and a system for these refugees to land safely in the Philippines. And I would like to share with you those nine waves of refugees that ended up in the Philippines. The first wave was actually not the European Jews that were seeking refuge from the persecution of Nazi, the Nazi regime, but actually it was Russians. So there were approximately 800 Russians that left Russia during uh, what is known to be, uh, sorry, I have my notes here. <laughs> so they were fleeing Russia during the Socialist Revolution of 1917. And so throughout the 1920s, approximately 800 Russians left Russia. They got into several boats and they left because they were going to be killed. And they didn't know where they were going. They had no idea who would take them in and where they would find refuge. And it turns out that there were two places that would welcome them. And those two places were Shanghai, China, and Manila, Philippines. So these Russians were the first wave of refugees that came to the Philippines. And yeah, that was the very start of this wave of refugees that started coming. And that's probably what instigated President Quezon to start his open door policy and to establish that. The second wave was the over 1,200 European Jews that came from Europe, and there was a whole like list of different types of uh, Jews from different countries in Europe. That was Germany, Poland, Austria, Hungary, former Czechoslovakia, Russia, Italy, Latvia, and Bulgaria. Fascinating stuff. So uh, that was just over 1,200, and that would have included uh, Rudolf Price, who was the uh, subject of that play that I saw last or two weeks ago now. The third wave were Spanish Republicans who were fleeing the end of the Spanish Civil War, and that would have been in the late 1930s, so just before the start of the Second World War. The fourth wave was over 30,000 30, Chinese came from mainland China during the Chinese Civil War. And they were fleeing the newly formed Communist People's Republic of China. Now what's interesting is that the next wave, the fifth wave of refugees that came to the Philippines were Russians again. And these Russians were not from Russia necessarily. They were actually from Shanghai, China. So because of all of the turmoil that was happening in China, Russians came over from Shanghai to the Philippines to seek refuge during that time. The sixth wave are approximately 2,700 Vietnamese that were fleeing the fall of Saigon to the North Vietnamese. The seventh wave were Iranians in the late 1970s who were fleeing the Iran Revolution. The eighth wave of refugees to the Philippines were 400,000, 400,000, I can't even imagine how many people that is, but 400,000 Indo-Chinese who were coming from Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam, and they were fleeing the regime changes that were taking place at that time. And the ninth wave of refugees that came to the Philippines were the East Timorese, who were fleeing the struggle for independence from Indonesia. That all happened because of President Quezon's open door policy that was established in the 1930s. And I just find it super remarkable that the Philippines was a haven in this capacity. Uh, when President Quezon had his open door policy specifically for European Jews, um, there was a statue that was then erected in Tel Aviv, Israel, in his honor and inscribed on that statue were these words, the people of the Philippines will have in the future every reason to be glad that when the time of need came, their country was willing to extend a hand of welcome. I just think that that really says a lot about President Quezon. And I'm not really, 
well versed in his I, I know that he's a big deal in Philippine history. Obviously, there is a whole area of Manila that is named after him. So I look forward to diving deeper into his place in Philippine history and learning more about this incredible man who created and established this policy that put Philippines on the map in terms of being a haven for refugees. So that's the main thing that I wanted to share with you today. I also wanted to just give you a quick update since I can do this on my lives. It's so exciting that I get to update you in real time <laughs> as to what's happening with the series and with this channel. I released a new video, an edited video this past Monday on Memorial Day, and that was to honor Telesforo Trinidad, who is a U.S. Navy sailor who had earned the Medal of Honor for his valor in the early 1900s. And there is a ship being named after him, a U.S. Navy ship being named the USS Telesforo Trinidad. Very exciting news. And uh, that came out on Monday. And the reason why I'm telling you about that is because I got many, many, many comments about this video <laughs> because I named this ship a battleship. And as I have learned over the last several days, battleships just aren't being built anymore <laughs> because they basically got phased out because they were no longer up to standards with what the U.S. Navy needed in order to have its presence on the waters. And so, yeah, the USS, Tele the USS Telus for Trinidad is not a ba battleship, as I had said. It is actually a destroyer. And I even was saying, oh, yeah, this destroyer battleship, blah, blah, blah. And all these people were like, there's no such thing as a battleship destroyer. It's either a destroyer or a battleship, and battleships aren't being made anymore. So I just wanted to make that clear that, I, yes, I have learned that the USS Telus for Trinidad will be the 89th Arleigh Burke class guided missile destroyer, not battleship and that that is very good news for the Filipino community, something that we could be very proud of and that I am excited to share more about in the coming months. In particular, on Veterans Day, around that day, I will be sharing the many interviews that I had done in order to learn about Telesforo Trinidad. The other thing I wanted to update you on is that, yeah, exciting news. I signed my very first contract to do a UGC ad. <laughs> I was telling my, my family about it and they're like, what's UGC? And it stands for user generated content. And that basically means that a a partner, somebody who, you know, a company that owns a brand and, you know, it can be any company. It could be Delta Airlines or it could be, um, I don't know, Ikea or whomever, you know, something that's related to what it is that my channel is about. They have approached me and I have signed a contract with them and I will be creating an ad for them. Very exciting. And I just want to give a shout out to my girl, Cameron Monet, who is a fellow YouTuber and Instagrammer and all fabulous things influencer. And she is a lawyer in addition to being all of those things. And she was instrumental in helping me sign that contract. So I just want to give a shout out to her and to let y'all know, this is a big secret. You can actually book a session with her to talk about all things influencer related. Not many people know about this. I don't know why more people don't know about this. It is the greatest thing since sliced bread, the fact that she offers this service to her fellow influencers. And I am just so grateful for everything that she does and the path that she has led for me to be able to do what it is that I do. That's it for today's live. Thank you so much for joining me. This happens every Thursday at 3 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. And what's interesting is that I see that I think one person joined me for like 30 seconds and then hopped off. And it's kind of cool that I get to do these lives by myself <laughs> for the time being until they like catch on and people start watching in real time. But it's just a lot of fun to be able to knock out these live episodes and share with you what it is that I'm learning and what it is currently that is moving me and to do that with you as it's happening here on Filipina American Creative. So I will see you next Thursday, same time, same place. I may not be in the same place. I actually might be in a different place next Thursday. So look out for that and I will see you next week. Thanks so much for watching. Paalam. Goodbye.